Hello, ladies and gentlemen. My name is Eric Farewell, and welcome to the Ask Aviator podcast, episode number 28, which I honestly can't believe we're already there. 28 episodes in, answering your questions about paramotoring live on YouTube, Facebook, and of course, recorded in the podcast. For all of you listeners, thank you very much for checking in with us. We have quite the episode ahead of us, and this is one that I've actually wanted to do for quite some time. Uh, we're going to talk about your paramotor questions later in the episode, but first, I'm going to bring a guest in who is someone very near and dear to my heart. Uh, in the last few episodes, I have been accused of uh, ripping on my guests a little too much, and uh, I, I promise that might happen tonight. The problem is I keep bringing people in who I have close relationships with that uh, that I get along with really well, and I like to, to express my love by, by teasing endlessly. I think it comes from being a second child. But uh, anyway, all this to say, uh, great to be here. Nina, I can't see the screen. It says no signal, so I can't read. I'm sorry. Uh, but we have a lot to discuss about the legalities of where you fly from, how to maintain those flying sites, how you can uh, defend yourself, and also when the right times are to do that. Because it's definitely a delicate balance. It's definitely something you want to uh, really m be mindful of when to be overly gracious and when to be overly right and correct. So uh, hello to David DePinho. Uh, good to talk to you again. My friend just got off the phone with him. Uh, Walter, Walter's here. Adrian, Anime, Niak, Leanne Trout. Great to see you. Can't wait to see you in a couple weeks. Sandor is here. Good to see you. Jetson Graham, Mark Rogers, Moto Fly Guy. Man, Jason Gut. We've got all kinds of people in here. This is just absolutely awesome. So uh, we're going to talk about as much of the stuff as we can. I want to say a special hello uh, to my wife in her entire paramotor learning training class that's in session right now. They're up there at the Red Building eating pizza, and Chris just delivered pizza to us. I will avoid eating pizza on the stream just to be gracious, but uh, great to, to, to have all of you guys watching. And a huge shout-out to my bride who completed her eighth flight this morning above the beautiful skies of Florida. So super, super awesome stuff. Uh, I'm going to introduce my guest for the evening. Uh, this gentleman came into our lives uh, in a really unique way and has stuck with us through a lot. We can't be more thankful for him. Uh, so, John, you want to come join me? Sure. Ladies and gentlemen, John Stidham Esquire. I should have learned your middle name by now. My name is Jonathan Wade. Jonathan Wade Stidham. Stidham. All right, so Jonathan Wade. All right, here's how it works. So we gotta, we got to get close to the microphone. Okay. See, we basically eat the mic. It's good. Uh, and then we talk. I read questions. You talk to me. Uh, and I'll try to bring things back and forth. Um, Johnny uh, Vegas pointed out that I have a very big glass of scotch. Actually, this is a, a candle holder, like a little votive for a votive candle. Uh, it's about three ounces total <laughs> if I filled it all the way to the top. So it looks big. <laughs> Well, sir, do you have some more wax in that one? Yes. There's, okay. <laughs> we got water in here. You'll probably be all right then. <laughs> we'll be all right. Yeah. So uh, we're going to talk tonight, uh, and you and I kind of had a, a quick briefing before we did this because we want to talk. Ooh, don't know what it was, but it was a loud noise. Uh, we we want to talk about, well, first off, how we met, what our experience has been at this airport, and why we fought as hard as we did, We kind of what the core – both of us share a, a value of trying to defend the sport on a national level. Um, and then we're going to talk about some specific cases. We've got some really good questions that have come in. Uh, some actually some really cool, some cool questions from David Nickerson, uh, from a couple of gentlemen who are, are stuck in the Minneapolis area where 40 years of oppression against ultralights. That sounds like a pretty heady term, but that's what it is. It's oppression against ultralights and it's done illegally in a lot of cases. Uh, so we're going to talk about that stuff and yeah, Hi, John. Hey, Eric. <laughs> How do we meet? Well, I um, decided I wanted to become a paramotor pilot. Did you see Jacqueline's boyfriend? You know, <laughs> I think I may be the only person that became a paramotor pilot before I, or came to Aviator before I even knew who Tucker Gott was. So Jacqueline's boyfriend? Yeah. Okay. 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 I, 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 know, I only know him that way, so. Uh, no. <laughs> I can understand that. Um, anyway, I live 14 miles from here. And so when I came to school here, I just thought that Aviator was the closest paramotor school. And that's why I picked it. So that's how we met. When you came, I, I remember, though, you came in, was it February? No, it was September, two no, years ago. No, when ago. you first came. Oh, yeah, yeah. You came to visit. Right. Right? And then... Right. You, you wanted to sign up for classes, and th there was a bit of a delay. We had a, a, a waiting list. And I, I'll never forget because 
we, you know, we research our students. We like to get to know who they are before they come, <clears throat> especially the local ones, because they're going to be in our life for a while. And I see Bartow, Florida. I see John Sidham. So I Google John Sidham, Bartow, Florida, and it comes up, John Sidham, personal injury lawyer. I was like, oh, Lord. <laughs> <laughs> Travis and I turned to each other. We said, okay, so he's a lawyer. We've had some lawyers that come through in the past, and they learn really well. You guys are great at absorbing knowledge, like exceptional at it. You mean the other ones? <laughs> I'm not. I'm not busting balls here. I have made an agreement. I'm being nice on this podcast. I've been too mean on the last ones. So, Eric, if you want to tell the world that I am the worst student you've ever had, I'm okay with it. I told you before the podcast began that I don't mind when you're an asshole to everybody. <laughs> Got to keep it PG now. Come on. Oh, that's right. At least you PG have a th- jar I'm supposed to put money in like I see on Robert Michael's show. <laughs> this isn't quite, this isn't quite uh, uh, Robert Michael's I'm show. Gonna, I will try my best. No, the reality is every student learns their own pace, and I will still stand by the fact that I think that I was the worst student I've ever trained. And I had professional training before I had to train myself. So you did all right. You overcame a lot of crap. A lot. I, I, we had our alliance retreat where all the alliance members came together in January. We brought John in to talk about liability and business and how to form your businesses and all this stuff. And I, I asked him, I said, would you mind starting off and kind of sharing the joy you've experienced from flying, kind of share the, 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 the adventure you've had and, and how great it's been? And he spent the next 36 minutes talking about everything that had gone wrong with his training, with his equipment. <laughs> How sorry my instructors were. Yeah. <laughs> it was it was with all three priceless. of them watching me. Yeah, it was yeah. pretty pretty solid stuff. So you you came to learn to fly with us in September. I'd say by day ten, you might like have liked us a little bit. By day twenty, did you like us at all? I like Travis. <laughs> God. I'm sorry. <laughs> uh, I want to really quickly just say. Uh, oh, I like Mary too. Mary's great. Yeah, Mary's she great. great. Yeah, she she's pretty solid. Um, anybody else you liked? You and Kyle were. Yeah. <laughs> Can't take him anywhere. Uh, so Kylo Glee's here. He'd like to agree with you um, that, uh, that that I'm pretty terrible. Uh, Jacqueline says that I'm pretty nice because I call Tucker her boyfriend. You're um, the sweetest guy I know. So this is how you know lawyers lie for a living. All right, so, so uh, from there, I'll never forget the day. You, you pulled Travis and I into our office, and you very graciously expressed to us that our waiver was garbage uh, and that we, doing this for a living, had a lot to learn when it came to understanding how to mitigate liability. Obviously, we were doing everything as well as we could, the safely, safest way possible, et cetera, but how, how we could ensure not only that our students stayed safer, but to protect ourselves as we built a business. And then from there, you got all too involved because you're too nice of a person, except to me. And he did it for Travis, by the way. Maybe Mary. <laughs> probably Mary. And you helped us with our waivers. You helped us through all that stuff. And that was when we started getting back into having struggles with our airport where we had airport management and city staff that were directly limiting our ability to utilize the airport for aeronautical usage because they deemed it to not be aeronautical. Uh, At the time, we had a a very young airport manager come in, and his first act was to film us and photograph us in every possible modicum of operation that we had, and then walked up to us one day out of the blue and handed us a, uh, what's it called? A cease and desist letter from the city attorney. Yes, which was interesting. You tell some more of the story. Well, the first copy I saw of the letter, it was crumpled up. It had been crumpled up. I could barely read it because someone apparently had crumpled it up and thrown it at someone else. I put it in my pocket. Oh, okay. I I was trying to keep it safe. Yeah, so... (laughs) All of a sudden, one day, we get a a letter from the city attorney for Lake Wales um, stating that we were not allowed to tow anymore. And it had, he, the Lake Wales attorney had sent it at the request of our airport manager, who had very little experience in the aviation world. He was not a pilot himself. And 
apparently when he came to Lake Wells Airport, he decided that he was going to go on a mission to get rid of the paramotor pilots here. And not just us. I mean, he, he admitted in his emails, which we eventually were able to, to recover, uh, that his goal was to shut down uh, the skydive towing operation. And the only way to do that was to shut ours down as well so that it wouldn't be unfair. Uh, what he failed to recognize at the time was that both – were legal aeronautical uses of a public airport that receives public funds through federal and state grants. It's kind of a big deal. Yeah, I, he obviously did not understand or he decided to ignore certain requirements that all public airports have if they're receiving federal money. Well, and I think at that point in our friendship, it was really crucial because neither Travis nor I have ever been through anything like this before. And, and here we are doing our best to serve our clients, to put on huge events that bring in thousands of people to the area, to bring, you know, eight people in every two weeks to learn to fly, who stay in the local hotels, who eat local restaurants, who do a good job of, of, of building up the city that I grew up in, the city that I love. And all of a sudden we have the city attacking us. And so we had to go through an incredibly arduous process, which we couldn't have done without you. And, and quite frankly, I, I introduced you through our previous podcast as an aviation attorney. And the reality is you're an airport special use attorney now. You have educated yourself <laughs> more than I think anyone should. <laughs> so thank you. Well, I had a personal stake in it. You were flying here. I fly here. Yeah. Yeah. Yeah, I mean, I, if we actually went down the line, the litany of the process, I, I'm going to do the, the Cliff Notes version really fast. Uh, we get a letter that says we can no longer do something that is crucial to the safety of our operation. Uh, we then convened, discussed, fired a letter back to the city attorney stating that this is a legal use of the airport. Uh, get a letter back. No, it's not. Which I love our city attorney. He's been a family friend for many, many years. He's a friend of yours as well. Like we, good guy, really good guy. But he's not an aviation guy, right? So he doesn't actually understand. So we, when he was relying upon the airport manager, which is what it, he should right. do. You know, he of should course. rely upon the expert. So then we said, okay, we we've got to attack this head on. So we filed a section six, section thirteen. It's thirteen. It's actually a part thirteen. Part thirteen. Informal complaint. Informal complaint to the FAA stating that they were violating their grant assurances under Section 22. Assurance 22, assurance, correct. If I just call them all sections, he'll fix it for me. So Assurance 22, which basically stipulates that we have economic non-discrimination. When an airport has federal funds received, they have to sign an agreement to get those funds so they can improve their airport to say that the guy flying the Cessna is just as important as the guy flying the, the G6, right? They can't discriminate based upon type, gender, or anything else. It's, it's you know, it, it, they can't discriminate. And that's what they were doing to us. So we filed that, and as we filed that, we also filed for a uh, public records request to see the airport manager's emails because it was important for us to see what else he was trying to stir up and what the next shoe was going to drop, right? Correct. <laughs> well... That's what we assume he was doing. And we discovered that was the case. There yeah. was a lot of other stuff that he'd filed with the FAA and yeah. <laughs> tried to get the city to – my favorite one was probably the fact that he tried to get the city to agree to shut us out of the public-use restrooms because we were using too much toilet paper. Well, <laughs> then he said that the women could use the restrooms, but, but the, the men, men were not allowed to use the restrooms. And that we would have to walk three-quarters of a mile with our equipment to, to the launch site because he wouldn't allow vehicles in, which created a whole ADA complaint. That <laughs> it just, it, it, it compounded. So we, we, we were sharing this story uh, to, to say that, A, we won our complaint with the FAA. We won our public records request uh, lawsuit that we ended up with because uh, the gentleman who was the airport manager claimed it was going to cost him a ridiculous number of hours and dollars to be able to remove security information from the emails. Um, which he did redact uh, the same emails 14 times in a row. Uh, so that, that was a, a, a good victory for, for us. And uh, the gentleman recently re resigned. So we're, we're grateful that we have a, a wonderful new interim airport manager. She's fantastic. And we did all of this <coughs> on one side as a selfish 
hope you wanted to keep flying here because it's down the street from you. And on the other, uh, multiple times we had the conversation, like how much are we willing to spend? How much are we willing to, to put in our heart and our soul? And we kept saying it's for the same reason. I remember uh, Drew from Skyfield was going through a lot of the same issues where the airport manager told them that the only ultralight pilots allowed to fly from the field were, were only allowed to if they had a private pilot's license. It's like, that's not legal. You can't do that. So we were fighting for the whole country. We were trying to, to build a basis for all of us to work with them. And you did that. It was you, man. Good job. Well, we were kind of in a box. Well, we were in a box because oh, yeah. we had our landlord essentially trying to kick us out. Even though we were doing everything that we could possibly do to get al- along with the fixed wing pilots who basically act as if they hate us about half the time. Even though most of us are fixed wing pilots that fly here. Right. With, with the, with the para- like, par- most of our paramotor pilots, our instructors, are fixed wing pilots or they're in training to become fixed wing pilots. Very true. The non-paramotor pilots who, frankly, they're afraid of us. And um, I think that they're, uh, I have seen signs of jealousy that they don't like the fact that we can go and fly around an oak tree if we want to. Um, and they can't. I think it's that type of, because I have heard hmm. them express things like, they just think they're so free. Things like that. <laughs> my I favorite, heard that actually in a public meeting. My favorite line is... is true, the, by the way. <laughs> you know, yeah, we are free. My favorite line so far is a, a gentleman who's, he, he, he vacillates between being our friend and reporting us to the FAA for doing terrible things like using an airport. Uh, he, he says, airports are for airplanes. Okay. That's, I appreciate that knowledge. I also have airplanes at this airport. Um, however, airports are for aeronautical activity as their first and primary focus. And according to the FAA, who gives us these federal funds, their secondary objective is to generate economic impact as with any other port by the generation of jobs, tourism, et cetera, right? It's, it's in there, that PowerPoint from the one in Georgia. Remember that, w- by the way, we have done so much research. We've spent so much time. We've invested way too much of ourselves. We have every piece of documentation on this cu- subject, period, that the FAA has probably ever released, including dozens of these cases and case law. Um, so, yeah. There actually is not a lot of case law. But um, what there is, I'm pretty sure we have. <laughs> and we've read. I'm pretty sure we've read it all. Yeah. Um, because Eric hasn't told you this yet, but I am not an aviation lawyer. I am a trial lawyer, and I have a bunch of friends who are paramotor pilots, and I love it too. And because I happened to show up in, at Aviator because it was 14 minutes from my house, um, I have become something, I guess, of an expert in airport access law. Um, And it's not such a large body of work that it was particularly difficult for me. But we have had to spend a lot of time making sure that we had the bases covered. And fortunately, with our Part 13 complaint with the FAA, we were successful with that. And we actually had to try our public records case against the city of Lake Wales and um, we won that case, and then we went to the city of Lake Wales, and um, because they then owed us substantial funds for attorney's fees and costs under Florida's public records statute, and we were able to leverage um, what happened in the public records case to get the city to basically capitulate on every single thing that they were had been fighting us over. And this is this is. Part of the reason why I brought John on <clears throat> is I have uh, I have given him many things, but what I believe is deserved is the whole community has an opportunity to recognize, at least our students, to recognize what you've done because you gave up a ton of money, your multiple and everything else. You don't have to go into I, stuff like that. But the, rea- the reality is you were able to use your negotiating skills to be able to say, listen, we need to be able to tow, to be able to fly, to be able to operate safely, to be able to do what we are designed to do, to continue to build a business 
that inspires people to overcome their fears through flight, to inspire people to be who they're meant to be by flying. And I thank you. And I think that as people hear the rest of this story and they start to see how what we've done can affect them personally, whether they're flying in Minneapolis and haven't been able to for 40 years, et cetera, et cetera, et cetera. I think it's, I'm telling you from my heart, thank you. Because you went all in. Well, I am all in for aviator. And I am all in for paramotoring. You just hosted your first paramotor fly-in. I, it was not a fly-in. It was a paraparty. Fly-ins <laughs> are where you have 460 pilots all running around in the air. Paraparty. And hopefully we'll get to that issue, too, before we're done. That is good. So we, we, I want to dive into to some very specific uh, questions that we've had. And I want to, we had three topics we want to talk about first. Public use airports. Private, uh, public use areas that are not airports, and then private use areas. We want to talk about those three things, uh, and then I want to dive into some questions. But what I hope people take away from this is understand that with enough research, enough good friends like, like John, or enough money, if you know you're in the right through your research and you're willing to invest in it, you can defend your rights to utilize a public use airport. But it may take work. That's one of the reasons why we started the Aviator Foundation, which we still don't have a website up yet to accept donations, but we will soon. Because A, we wanted to encourage flight, but B, we wanted to defend flight. We want to have guys like you helping to defend pilots anywhere in the country who are struggling to maintain their flying spaces. Tucker's video is a perfect example. You know, we've got a group of guys who flying from a site as the sport's growing and went from one or two guys flying like it used to be here at Lake Wales, it'd be me and one other guy who flew in the area. Now, I think I counted last uh, Thursday, there was 32 pilots here. Like That's a lot of daggum paramotors, man. Like, just a few Thursdays ago. Anyway, like it's, it's a lot of pilots. It's a lot of pilots. And those of us who fly from here regularly, we try not to complain about it when too many people show up. Because you get kind of spoiled when you live 14 miles away. <laughs> right. From the center of, you know, really great, fun paramotoring times which of course is why you have the five instructors that you have or i think we're up to now? 13 Th okay well <laughs> i forgot about the other school momentarily yeah yeah it's it's growing it's a great it's place to be but i don't want to brag about it too much yeah you can't brag too much if you brag too much everyone shows up i i, I heard that there was a, a rumor of a certain time when a certain someone might be here and i'm up to i think five people who've been like hey can i come too and i was like it's not a gathering. You can just show up if you want to. You're, everyone's always welcome. Just please don't get in the way of the students. Like that's, right. that's the heart of it. Uh, all right. So let's talk about public use airports, what our rights are. Okay. You need to let me give a little disclaimer. Yes. And it's not even really a disclaimer. I, I guess this sort of is advice. You should take everything, the people out there in paramotor world should take everything that I say with a grain of salt because, first of all, I'm only licensed to practice law in three states. And I really only know much about the law in the state of Florida. Um, except, so, for, except for the fact that you passed the bar in those other two states without even having to try. So, Well, and I practice in those other states a little bit, too. But, <laughs> but it's much of what we're going to be talking about could differ from state to state. Absolutely. Now, the matters that involve the Federal Aviation Administration, while they overlap with state laws in their application, um, <clears throat> they are uniform throughout the country, of course. So that's the beauty of federal hopefully law. people can get some information from this. Um, but I am not giving anybody here legal advice, even if it sounds like it. I'm here to talk about the, the topic. I think I know more than the average paramotor pilot about it. Um, so I'm hoping I can help. But I'm not giving legal advice. Obviously, you have to make the disclaimer uh, because we live in a lit litigious society. But I'm in the middle of a jury trial, and that's why I'm wearing a tie. So when I show up at Aviator wearing my tie, everyone wonders who I am at first. It actually, it's it's really bizarre. If he's not wearing a Columbia shirt, Wranglers, and uh, occasionally a cowboy hat, we don't recognize him. It's it's just not right. But you guys may recognize that John. Was some pl other place you saw me wear a cowboy hat. That's true. If you guys have been watching our videos for a long time, last July, John hosted myself, Travis, Kyle, and Micah at his ranch in Montana, and it's one of my favorite paramotor videos I've ever made. Did you watch the latest video, the announcement video of our of our journeys? No. Well, there's just like half the Montana footage is in there because it was so beautiful. Oh. I had to select from nine, eight and a half years of footage. And there's like 
it's a seven minute video and it's at least uh, 50, 60 seconds of Montana. So <laughs> it's pretty good. <laughs> we had a great time and I love that video. Because yeah, now I can, when I'm talking about Montana, I can just show people. This is what it looks and like. And then they get to see I'm paramotor pilot too. That's, That's cool. <laughs> <laughs> you know how you can uh, figure out who the pilots are at a party? Oh, they'll tell you. <laughs> I love it. <clears throat> all right. So all, right. Uh, all this to say, it's not legal advice. However, uh, one thing I've learned from John is is that with enough dedication and enough experience, which you have, how many years have you been a lawyer? 32. 32 years as a lawyer. You've been a lawyer almost as long as I've been alive. Right. All right. So you have a lot of experience, a lot of knowledge, and you have a lot of care for the specific area. So we're going to talk some about what you can do as a paramotor pilot to legally protect yourself and protect your flying sites. But before we do that, I'm going to give a 70 second speech. Might be 90. All right. (laughs) John's starting a timer. There, There is absolutely the time to be right, to be legal, to understand what your rights are as a pilot or as a human. There are other times where it's more important to be gracious. And I say this because uh, many years ago, about <clears throat> seven years ago now, uh, we used to train, actually six, six years ago, I was training Tucker. Uh, you, We would go to the coast, Treasure Island. We'd kite and fly. Whenever it was windy here, we'd go fly on, on Treasure Island. And I'll never forget the police showing up and telling me, you can't fly here anymore. It's a $200 fine, blah, blah, blah. And it was because of one guy. There were two guys flying. One guy was in the air. Other guys on the ground. Madeira Beach, Florida. Uh, guy on the ground. Cops roll up. It's a sheriff's department. Uh, they say, hey, we can't fly from here anymore. All the drones have stopped us allowing anyone from flying off the beaches with any kind of flying device. The city council just put it into effect. Can you radio your buddy? The guy on the ground was like, oh, I'm so sorry. I didn't realize there's a new law. We've been flying here for years. Uh, yeah, I can radio my buddy. So hands the radio to the sheriff. Deputy gets on the radio, says, hey, sir, I'm sorry to let you know. You're welcome to keep flying, but you can't launch here anymore. It's no longer legal. The guy in the air goes, F you. I know my rights. Only the FAA can tell me what to do. Within less than six months, every beach on the west coast of Florida in that Tampa Bay region was shut down. So while the pilot in the air was correct, the sheriff can't tell him where he can fly. The FAA has the right over that. The reality is there are times where maybe being a little more gracious would behoove you so know your know your law know your legality but be gracious we're about to teach you a whole bunch of legality please use it with caution just like the idea of with great power comes great responsibility this matters here too guys please 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 all right so speech done was i under time i was good all right let's talk a little bit about just a Joe Blow Airport in Ohio. Airport manager went, recently went to an AOPA airport manager's conference. He's fired up. He found out that their town of 6,000 people and their airport, which he's allowed to manage part time because he's the Parks and Rec manager also, uh, could make so much money. Instead of being in the red for the last 70 years, like it has been, uh, he's going to have the opportunity. If he can build this airport out using federal money, federal grants, and state grants, he can take all this money, funnel it to the airport, extend the runways, put in a control tower that's open when it needs to be open. He can take all this money and get a fuel truck, build a beautiful terminal building, and he can attract business jets. Now, the only thing standing between him and business jets is not the fact that there's no one with a business jet within 100 miles of him. The only thing that's standing between him are these few guys skydiving, flying small planes, or flying paramotors? So he does what the logical thing is, is this guy is trying to keep his job because it's an airport that loses money. Why would the city pay him to, to run it? He says, listen, I'm going to shut down all these f- people having fun so that my city can make money so I can get a raise. This is actually pretty much a true, like, accurate representation of the story that we've experienced, other people have experienced, uh, where people are, in, managers are encouraged to receive a grant in order to enlarge their airport, in order to gain business jets, because they'll sell so much fuel and it'll help. But 
their in initial recourse is to shut down fun flying. Now, say you're that pilot. You've been flying there for seven years. This is home. This is the place where you come every day that's calm so you can go up there and you can get an attitude adjustment, an altitude adjustment. You can go up and just experience the joy of flight. What do you do? What do you do when they tell you that you can't fly there anymore? When they say, listen, we've decided it's unsafe. You're flying 30 miles an hour, 300 feet off the ground. you got airplanes flying in around 100 miles an hour, 1,000 feet off the ground, and now we're going to bring business jets in at 200 miles an hour, and it's not going to be safe for you to be here. And the business jets won't come if you're here. It um doesn't matter if you've ever flown at the airport before. Under FAA regulations, and I actually, when you're ready for some stuff, you might want to write down. Bring out the notepads, guys. Not much. Don't worry. I am completely ill-prepared for this particular endeavor this evening because I am in the middle of a jury trial. I picked a jury this morning. Um, but I think I can give you some things that, that should help you. Um, let me back up and be just as basic as I can. I think it'll start make with it basics. Easier. Yeah, I, I like that. If you start with the basics of, of where you, Joe Pilot, start, and then go into the legalese, I think okay. it's powerful. Yeah. Well, I think first of all, I need to give a <clears throat> general overview of what the federal law is, and then I'll go into how you can deal with it. All right. Okay. I like. I, th it. I think that'll be better. Not it's your show, but okay. The United States Constitution. Um, gave certain powers to Congress, the Congress of the United States. And the Congress of the United, one of those things, powers is to make laws. And the Congress of the United States decided after airplanes started becoming popular that it would be safe, especially once, I believe, once air um, passengers started coming into existence that in order for it to be safe that the federal government should regulate the airspace and it continues to regulate the airspace um, under the auspices of the federal aviation administration which is part of the united states department of transportation and because of that the faa has the right to regulate and therefore has the right to control pretty much everything that's not on the ground right States, on the other hand, um, cities in particular, tip, or typically anyway, um, municipal-type airports, county airports, um, they have the right to control what's happening on the ground. Right. And so conflicts can arise, and that's the conflict that arose here at Lake Wales, and that's the conflict that you've heard about, as have I. I tend to think that they must. There must have been some airport managers' convention somewhere where there, some bozos, <laughs> where some bozos stood up and told all these city managers and airport managers, whoever, that they were never going to be successful unless they became a jet port, and that you're never going to be able to do that if you have ultralight activity. Mm -hmm. And there have been a number of instances zephyr hills for example here in florida and, I, and lake wales would be another example where the ultralight community basically made up virtually all of the air traffic we're over 90 percent of the activity at this airport as far as takeoffs and landings we are over 90 percent of the activity at this airport historically between 70 and 90 is our average it's a lot so I believe that horror stories about paramotors have started to make their way through the airport manager's world, whatever that may be. We because actually, we've heard it from three or four different sources, people having the exact same thing come mm -hmm. back to them, that they the city wanted their airport to become a jet port. Right. We, we saw the same thing happen. We were looking at different airports to, to move our, our second school to, and... We had an airport that we were looking at that was a beautiful airport, a little busier than we wanted to be. They already had leased the majority of their infield to the skydivers. And we went and met with the airport manager, and he called our airport manager, the one who's now gone. And he started sharing all these stories, and, and quite frankly, it, 
it ended up requiring an email from you to the city attorney letting him know that tortious, tortious interference is a very serious issue and that you'd be suing the city if this airport manager continued uh, to lie and to even share his opinion versus sharing fact. Um, which, again, this is just a, a, another level of commitment that we have to trying to keep airports legally usable. Um, and then in contrast to that, you have an airport like Dinellen, where our new school is. And that airport has a new airport manager. He's a retired uh, Air Force uh, NCO. <clears throat> Great guy, Mike. And he came in after nine years of an airport manager who was trying to turn Dinellen into a jet port. Now, they're only 25 miles away from Ocala. There are tons of millionaires in the area. They have the, the, it's horse country, right? But Ocala is towered, has crash fire rescue, I believe. They have uh, maintenance facilities. They have a beautiful FBO, tons of services. And for nine years, this manager had spent the city's money to build all the services he thought he needed to get the jet trucks, the million-dollar fuel trucks in place, and barely ever had a jet visit. So when the new manager took over a year ago, he said, listen, if we just focus on general aviation, ultralights, stuff that's fun to fly, we can make this airport profitable. And so in the last year, he has. Friday nights, they have a race course set up on the closed runway. They charge people admission. They let them race on the closed runway. They, they have the sheriff come out, and they lease part of the airport from them to teach them how to do pit maneuvers, right? It's a completely different mindset. But the problem is the majority of airport managers who are causing issues all went to the same convention a decade ago, right? Well, we don't know that there was a convention. Pretty sure. But that's what we suspect <clears throat> because it does seem to be coming from several different directions. So... Another thing that the Congress decided to do that was pretty neat was they gave the Department of Transportation a whole bunch of money, and they assigned part of it to airports for the purpose of having allowing general aviation airports to exist. And most general aviation airports, like the city of Lake Wales's airport, where we are now, they get their funding to do most of their capital improvement projects um, from the federal government. And when they do that, <laughs> they do have some commitments, but they're commitments that the airport managers seem to have, many of them seem to have a, a difficulty accepting. Um, and certainly our airport manager here at Lake Wales did. But as a result of that, the or let me back up. So when a city takes funds, federal funds, from the FAA, they do so under certain obligations that they have and one of the obligations is that they not discriminate against any type of aeronautical activity now when we're up in the air we're supposed to give the right of way to everybody else we all know that yeah right of way we have to give right away we have to ensure that we are uh we're we're pretty strictly regulated ourselves as pilots no we're at the bottom of the barrel yeah and we were nobody we're not nobody, but we're close to it, <laughs> I think. Close. We're certainly, as far as rights as a pilot in the air, we're supposed to basically stay away from everybody else. We all get that. We're supposed to give the right away. But when it comes to airport access, it's something completely different. We have the same rights as anybody else does at any airport. And if a pilot were to find that he is um, being denied access from an airport, um, then there are things he can do about it. And they, he can do things about it because of the certain obligations that that airport took on, that it is legally, uh, by regulation and statute, obligated to, um, to follow, and it's also contractually obligated to follow it. Uh, in order to receive the federal funds, they have to agree to certain things, which include allowing all aeronautical activities to take place at their airport. Now, there are some real um, exceptions. For example, we're not talking about a place where there's a controlled field. If there's a controlled field, the tower determines whether you can fly from there or not, and that's pretty much the end of the story. We actually had a, a, an experience about the exact story. Lakeland Airport, just west of us, about 40 minutes. Just west of you, about 24 uh, or 26. They contacted me the airport manager there 
who's a friend, uh, we, we sit on the, uh, one of the Sun of Fun boards together. And he said, we got this guy from Michigan. He came in. He asked for permission to fly. He called the tower on their, their landline. And we told him we couldn't, we couldn't let him fly. We just, the airport was too busy. There was too much going on. And he went off on us. He lost it. He said that it was his right, legal right, blah, blah. And he went nuts. And then he flew. And I said, I'm so sorry. I have no idea who it was. I have no, I understand that we are the point of contact for Central Florida for paramotoring. Like most people like Bartow Tower, Lakeland Tower, they call us when there's an issue because we generally know everybody. We don't know everyone from Michigan. I'm working on it, you know, but I haven't gotten there yet. But it was one of those situations where it's very important to recognize when you don't have rights and in a controlled airspace, you must have permission from the controlling agency to do anything, right? So we have stuff like this that dictates a foundation of what our rights are as pilots, but we still have to follow FAR 103. And if you're going to a controlled airfield and asking for permission to fly, you have to get permission. Very true. So, you're the regular paramotor pilot guy out there, and you get by your – it can be where you've been flying for your story, so I'll match your story. And all of a sudden they come and tell you that you can't fly there anymore. <coughs> Almost as certainly, unless they have already gone to the FAA's um, safety standards and received some sort of approval to stop you from flying there for safety reasons, almost certainly when they make that requirement, they are violating Grant Assurance 22. So here's, here's the little bit of paperwork. And you as the pilot can go to the, the local airport and you can tell them about several things. And here's what you can cite. But do it graciously, please, for God's sake. Go yeah, in yeah, with yeah. a questioning face and say, I believe from what I've read, this doesn't make sense. Do you know more about this than I do? I think that you're exactly right about the way to approach it. But here's the ammunition that you will have. There are a set of laws known as the Code of Federal Regulations, and they're set forth in a number of different titles. And you can Google this, and you'll find it right off. Title 14, CFR, Part 13. That is going to set forth how you can go about making an informal complaint to the FAA. So you can go to the your local airport manager and you can cite him also to him or her to title 49 u.s code section 4710 parentheses a close parentheses that is the federal statute that created the regulations that are found in the cfr and that is the federal statute that creates certain obligations on the part of it's also embodied in the cfr but that creates certain obligations on the part of airports who accept federal funds and then you can t also you can google this this is a a case that came about as a result of a formal complaint that was filed with the faa this is one of the most powerful cases for our case that that we used in our case and that is I believe the FAA believes this to be the law. 100% agreed. Um, and it is from, it was issued by the FAA out of Washington, D.C. It's called a director's determination. And it was obviously written by lawyers. <laughs> and it is as if a judge had issued an opinion. It's pretty much the same type thing. You can find it by Googling Orange County Soaring Association, Inc. versus County of Riverside, California. And one of the things I love about this case <clears throat> is it really exemplifies the idea of differentiating aeronautical activity, attempting to use the same airport. You know, Riverside is a very busy airport. It's, it's, it's an area where there are a lot of people, but you had a economically viable corporation, the Orange County Soaring Association, attempting to utilize the same space in a completely legal manner and the city or the county in that case found that it was cutting off 
what they perceived might be an economic boost to the bottom line of their airport. And the FAA found that that didn't matter. That's correct. Uh, what happened there was they actually closed a grass runway that was being used by the, um, the Soaring Association. And by doing that, they uh, effectively were eliminating ultralight activity in general from the airport. And the FAA determined, this director's determination has a bunch of really good stuff in it that would take too long to go through all of it. Um, but the FAA determined that ultralights have just as much a right to use the airport as anyone else. And that by closing the grass runway, what the airport was really trying to do was to limit the ultralight activity, and that was a violation of Grand Assurance 22. And Grand Assurance 22 is the one we've talked about before, which is the one that's all about economic non-discrimination. That's correct. The government in general is always about non-discrimination. Thank you, equal rights activists, right? We are in a point now where we have so much value placed upon assuring that we're not limiting access or we're not limiting anything based upon equal rights. I can say that um, anyone who doesn't, who wants to stick their head in the sand and think that this issue is not a serious issue for our ability to enjoy our sport, um, they're crazy because the fixed wing pot, as we get more and more paramotor pilots, we are getting on people's nerves more and more. And, and, and sometimes it, rightfully, but generally not. I mean, the majority of the time, obviously, we are always worried about being rightfully on someone's nerves or rightfully right. in Right. I'm wrong talking place. about just our existence, though. Yeah, yeah, I got At you. the airport. Right. Is getting on other pilots' nerves. And when people start bugging a federal bureaucracy like other pilots could do, then it can cause everyone to get stirred up. But the beauty of our situation now is that the FAA is completely on our side. They, not only did they, after we filed an informal complaint, which we can go into how to do that if you want to, after we filed an informal complaint, um, the FAA eventually came down here and they not only told the airport manager that he was wrong, they told him that if he had any questions that he should come and ask Eric and Travis. That was because an interesting day. And, and the <laughs> FAA told that, said that in a public meeting and basically forced the guy to apologize. After that, up until the time that he finally uh, resigned, I suspect that he resigned under some pressure, but I don't know for sure. I will neither confirm nor deny. Okay. All I've heard is rumors. But up until the time that he resigned, he acted as if it, after we won the lawsuit, got a rather substantial attorney's fee judgment against the city of Lake Wales because of their attempt, every, attempting to keep us from exercising our rights. And then after the FAA came, mostly, I think, and, and spanked him pretty hard, he tried to act like he was nice to us. But we then found out that he was filming us, taking pictures of he us. He was still trying to, to, to go back to the same route, which is, I mean, so, I, you can't fault them. That people, it's, it's a struggle for people to step outside of what their, their expectations are. And if they want a jet port, and I think the only thing keeping them from a jet port is not the fact that we're a town of 18,000 people and there's jet ports all around us. They think that it's just the paramotors and the skydivers. That's a tough thing for them. So, and this fits perfectly with where we are with the FAA. The FAA currently thinks that we're wonderful. Uh, or I don't know if they think that we're wonderful, but they think that we have, they know that we have the right, the same rights as any other aeronautical activity to use a public airport. And they will stand behind us on that, I believe. Certainly the folks from Atlanta, although I think our decision was made by people in Washington, D.C., um, we have reason to believe that. We do. Um, I believe that they will enforce the grant assurances. So if you go to an airport and you have someone like you have in Dunallen and like we think that we have here in Lake Wales, we certainly hope we do. She's great. People that will, will understand their obligations, then you're going to be in great shape. But if you run into someone like we had here at Lake Wales, um, then you're going to have to to do the best that you can to fight. And there are ways that all of you out there can fight without a lawyer. Um, hopefully, you have a trial lawyer near you that's also a paramotor pilot. <laughs> but if that 
man or woman exists, I would like to know about it. Yeah, if because you guys have a trial lawyer, friend, paramotor pilot, please let us know because we are assembling a legal team for the Aviator Foundation, and John's leading it. He doesn't know this yet. Um, <laughs> John's leading it, and our goal is to be able to fight in 50 states to be able to establish at least a fair place to start. Uh, because you, you've talked about rights a lot. The reality is, and I learned this when they, when they came up with the idea that we should have to walk almost a mile with our equipment to fly. The reality is, it's not just rights. It's civil rights. You know, when you look at saying that Joe Blow flying his paramotor is not worth as much as Joe Snow flying his jet, that's a civil rights issue. And each of us are increasing the economic development of the airport. Each of us are utilizing it for aeronautical, aeronautical use. We're all working together to try to keep it safe. And certainly there are pilots who don't. There, I, I know there are airports around this country where paramedic pilots are acting unsafely. Uh, however, if we do it properly and we are attacked because they feel as if this is what's holding them back, it's a civil rights issue. I can't really call it a civil rights issue because that has a different meaning. I'm me. quoting you from like three months ago. I don't think I ever called it a civil rights issue. When it was I, an ADA complaint and you were there oh, to, no, and it was like, is. listen, you want to ask okay, a disabled okay. guy to right, walk okay, a mile? Okay, okay, okay. That's I, a civil rights issue. That is a civil rights issue, but the general access portion At the is end not. of the day, general access plus you have to go and walk four and a half miles across an airport and you can't cross this run and you can't cross that. And they make it so it's impossible to actually, actually utilize it? It is discrimination. Right. And it is discrimination by, but it's not. Typical civil rights. Well, I'm not calling it a race issue. Okay. I'm not calling it a, a, a gender issue. I'm just saying it is an access utilization and putting one person far above another because they believe they're more valuable, which is, in a sense, I'm asking this as a question because I don't know. That is civil rights? Question mark? <laughs> um, it certainly is within um, the embodiment of the civil rights movement and the beliefs that are behind civil rights but civil rights have been codified by the federal government and that's typically what we lawyer types think of when we think of civil rights well i'm certainly not trying to diminish how much more egregious some things are but i want to to use that term because i think it's important for those who might have had a joe blow incident where they, they're being limited to to help their cities see the egregiousness that it could be you know, when we were going through our, our lawsuit with the city, our conversation was, listen, we're more than happy to, sp to pay extra money to do whatever we can to use this sleepy little airport that might get three to five airplanes a day at most on most days. And some days it's busier, but it's generally very quiet. You know, we have a skydiving operation. We have us. There's one other commercial operation on the field, but they don't fly from here, aside from once in my entire history at this airport. Um, I've only ever seen them fly once. Uh, we desperately want to see this airport succeed. So how can we help them succeed, right? And if they're viewing us through a filter that believes that we're lesser than another human, maybe that will help Joe Blow be able to say, listen, if you pursue this tact, there is a potential civil rights case in your, on your doorstep. And that's terrifying. Any, any city attorney goes, oh, crap. I don't want that. Well... Certainly, the argument, the ADA argument, um, would put what's ADA, the, the Americans with Disabilities Act. If you are, if they are, if an airport is requiring a pilot to to move to a location like we had here, where someone would have to walk that far, well, there are lots of paramotor pilots who can't carry their machine a mile. Right. If you don't believe it, come out to Lake Wells any time and look at the other people <laughs> my age. <laughs> I have wheels, but. <laughs> so anyway, Eric, I think we should let them know what the procedure is Walk in the event it. they get into a. Yeah. Obviously, I hope everyone, obviously, everyone doesn't know. Everyone should try their best to get along with their airport manager. Absolutely. That's going to be the best way they can go. 100%. Bend over backwards. Accept conditions that you can live with, but don't, even if you don't like them necessarily and even if you don't think that they're 
necessarily in compliance with the regulations, accept them anyway because it's a lot easier than fighting. But in the event you get someone like who we had who was just out to get us and was appeared to be willing to do whatever, even to perjured make that himself happen. multiple times on. All right. Well, <laughs> what, what I want to point out really quick as well, uh, <laughs> somebody put in the chat a moment ago that was pointing to me. He said, "I'm looking at getting into the sport, and this scares me." Yeah, well, we have lots of good stuff to talk about, too, but I guess we need to give them the bad stuff first. We're just going through the bad stuff, guys, because the reality is you can fly from your neighbor's field, you can fly from your yard, you can fly from the places where it's legal and easy, but occasionally some of us might have issues, and that's okay because we have the tools, thanks to guys like John, to be able to overcome them. So the way that you go about asserting your rights— other than just telling the airport manager when you have to that you have a right to fly from there and that you want, hopefully, that you want to get along with them completely. Uh, that's the way I would do it. Right. Um, but in the event you have to fight, there is a specific procedure that you have to go to, and it's found in that earlier site that I gave you, the 14 CFR site. If I'm going to inter interrupt really yeah. quick. For those of you guys who can't take notes fast enough for John Southern Draw, uh, we're going to have William Liddy write a blog post. He doesn't know this yet. I've just decided uh, I'm going to have a blog post written that depicts this entire podcast, the experience we've had and the experience that you might have, as well as all of the legal CFRs. Anything that we're going to mention here is going to be written down and put on our po our blog. Go to aviatorppg.com, uh, click on about, and then blog. You'll find all this information sometime in the next couple of weeks so that don't get inundated by the details. Continue. Right. The regulatory scheme uh, that the FAA has put out is all about trying to get local airports and pilots to get along with each other. And the scheme itself requires you, before you can file a complaint with the FAA, which is what your remedy is, before you can file a complaint, you have to try to work it out. And when you file your first level complaint, which is called a Part 13 informal complaint, you have to set forth in that complaint what you've done to try to resolve it, or they will right. kick it back to you and it'll, it'll get dismissed outright. They don't want to be there to try to stop bickering siblings. They want to be there to parent after the siblings have already tried to resolve. Because that's how we should really look at ourselves. We're supposed to be siblings on an airport, right? We're all here to fly. Right. And so they, if you don't do the work, just make the complaint, it's not going to help you. So then when you make the complaint, you have if you have a lawyer, they can probably help you uh, as far as the form of it and putting it together in a way that may be the most persuasive, that kind of thing. But you don't have to have a lawyer. And you can file an informal complaint, and all you do is – write out your story to them basically um, to the FAA and say that they're not allowing you to fly from the airport and they won't make any accommodation for you, anything you can think of. And you're required, and you'll see it under the rule that you have to follow, you're required to say what you've tried to do to, to work it out. Then you file it and the FAA gets it, and then you sit around and wait. And we had to wait quite a while, I think. We actually, we? according to the district office, we had a – rushed adjudication okay well we they had said to wait a while it, they said that the average is six months eventually however the faa did what they're supposed to do if they think you have a valid complaint and they issued a show calls order but then they set up a couple of meetings and eventually and we settled our part well we didn't settle it the faa ruled eventually issued a, an order that laid out and said that we were right the airport was wrong um I would cite that particular order to you, but frankly, there's some matters in it that I don't think are legally accurate, and so I don't think it's nearly as good of authority for you as the Orange County Soaring Association case. I agree, and and that's actually really indicative of an uh, as great as the FAA is, and we have a lot of friends there who are really smart people. Many of them don't understand Part 103. After the falling off of two place ultralights in the early 2000s and the, the advent to the light sport era, most FAA members focused on original part 91. They did not follow and understand the details of 103. So there are areas within our own education, our own decision 
that we like we contact them and say, hey, you made the right decision. We appreciate it, but your your understanding requires some better definition. So we're we're constantly you know we're trying to help our friends at the FAA, which we'd like to consider them friends because they are. As many people give the FAA heck, the reality is they are there as advocates for flight. And while they may understand business jets and Cessna 172s better than paramotors, they care about flight because that's where they get paid from, period. So we're always trying to grow it. But, yeah. so They, they were great to us. Great to us. Was, Good people. And they have been since then. They, they set up a what, – what's our meeting called that we go to? An airport every? users group meeting led by one Bob Jex, uh, he, who was the originator. Bob is uh, part of our local FISDO. We also have Steve, who's uh, the head of the FISDO here, who we got to know through the Paradigm team, which is one of the reasons why we have the Paradigm team, is we have a closer relationship with the FAA as our sport grows. But it gives us the opportunity to have fixed-wing pilots, flex-wing pilots, ultralight pilots all have interactions, air their grievances, and try to come to a decision on how to better things without dealing with having the FAA involved. The FAA is witnessing, but they aren't making decisions. So after the Part 13 complaint is resolved, either party can file a, a complaint under Part 16, which is a formal proceeding. In my mind, that proceeding would be difficult for any of you to go through um, without a lawyer. We so, were prepared to do it, and even with a lawyer who's a really good friend— the costs associated were so astronomical, even knowing we would win after reading every law, after even reading every, like, we went through every single case that the FAA had passed out, every single Section 13 complaint they put out. Travis and I read every one. You read every one that was valuable, and probably a lot that weren't, <laughs> and realized that if we had to go to a Section 16 complaint, we were willing, but this is the stuff that like Santa Barbara has gone through where they've had to refund millions and millions it, of dollars it will likely become major litigation yeah there's no doubt about it years in court tens and, of millions of dollars and the entire paramotor world should sort of be quivering in their boots a little bit about it if about it that happens. possibility yeah. ever happening because all it takes is one ruling like the orange county um, soaring association case that's against us instead of in favor of us and suddenly you there's know case we, law. we start having major problems yeah um but great thing about our sport is is we can fly from anywhere and we're pretty much the only one that can do that that's true and um the proof is in the pudding what i hope that our sport will do and um what i hope to encourage is that we start acquiring and one way or the other start acquiring more private places to fly so that we don't have to deal with the fixed wing pilots that we don't necessarily we don't like them either well, it's not that we don't like them. It's I mean, that, we don't like that, flying with them. Yeah, there's always a, a hint of nerves. When I when I fly my RV six, my I'm coming to the airport at 195, 180 miles an hour at a slow side. I'm descending. I'm coming. I'm punching through. I'm I'm like, I'm looking for paramotors like crazy because oftentimes coming back at sunset or sunrise, and I'm I'm going fast. If I see a paramotor, I have a few seconds to react. So it's not that I don't like fixed wing pilots. It's that I. As one, I'm concerned. I'm like, where are all the barely moving butt fans, right? So I, I love what you said here. If we have the opportunity, and this is one of the other reasons I wanted to bring you on, as a, a, def, a defense attorney, as a trial lawyer, I would love to get your perspective on what happens when, to quote Money Python, you buy great tracts of land uh, and, and you have this opportunity. Sorry, that was a boob joke. Um, you're welcome. The the uh, <laughs> I can laugh at my own. It's fine. It's fine. No, no, it's, it's not awkward. Um, the the this when is definitely the most appropriate conversation I've ever had with you. You're welcome. Yeah. Um, <laughs> when we have the opportunity to utilize private land, there are different levels of liability, and I do want to talk about it, but I want to put it off because I want to follow our plan. So we've walked through what we did at Lake Wales. The actionable items that someone who wants to file a section 13 complaint or then eventually a section or chapter 16 complaint eventually if they must what they can do my encouragement to each of you guys is to contact the offices of, of your law firm if they're going to do this um, i don't encourage this to half joe blow if you're half joe blow where something might go wrong you're not sure don't contact sit him he's really expensive 
All right, it, it's not worth his time or yours to get advice about what you might do. But when it comes time to say my rights have been infringed upon, I need to make a move. Contact John to find out what he re- recommended. As a fellow paramotor pilot, I'll put him on blast and say that he'll take your call and give you a consult for a few minutes. I'll be happy to talk to anybody that is having a serious problem. That's already happened, that. not that might happen. No, it happens. I'm just, I'm, I, I'm just, I'm just, I'm, I'm making sure because I do get calls from time to time, and the only time I get irritated is when I help somebody out. With some free advice, which I'm more than happy to do because I have a lot invested in this, too. You do. I want for our sport to continue to be as wonderful as it is. It's the most wonderful thing I've ever done. And I've been doing a lot of wonderful stuff for 60 years now. Are you Um, 60 now? I turned 60 a couple of weeks ago. Happy birthday, brother. You didn't wish me happy birthday. I I just did. You didn't tell me it was your birthday? I left. I I was not in town. He does his best to try to make me feel guilty about the things I don't know about. (laughs) All right. All right. So we're walking you through what you could do with the airport. That's your first line of defense. I I think that if you can fly from an airport that's not too busy, that you can safely operate out of, it's your best place to operate from because it's legally established as a place to fly from. Uh, I was born 33 years, 11 months ago, 10 months ago, uh, 180 yards, 200 yards from a private airport, a private runway. My grandfather instituted in the 1950s after he came home from World War II. He built a runway. And even though it's a public-use private airport where anyone who buys property around it has to sign, that they know there's an airport nearby, it has come under fire hundreds of times. FAA complaints, legal challenges. If you can use a municipal airport, Build a relationship with the local pilots. Become an asset. At Dunellen, one of the local paramotor pilots helps out. He mows. He he's there to help fuel airplanes. He's there to he's there to serve anybody, to fix the toilets. He he's there to help people. He's an asset to the community of fixed wing pilots. Not just there to to utilize and be a user, right? He's a good guy. If you can be that guy, so much the better. Because even a private use or privately owned public use airport has its own level of struggle. But let's go one step further. Let's say, and I saw this question come up a whole bunch. I I see Nina in the background deleting seven questions when I answer this or when I bring this up. To quote Tucker's situation, let's say you use a public use, publicly owned, non-airport for your flying activity. What are your rights? Oh, you don't have any. They do not accept federal funds. It's totally private or it's public, but not an airport. You don't have any rights. So what you're saying is that guys like Tucker flying from a public park are literally existing in that flying space solely at the graciousness of the city council county commission whatever whatever that 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 park falls under they are operating under the radar as long as they can and then subsequently which is it's a matter of time guys the sport's growing we have more pilots seeing that it can change their life in a way that's truly powerful And as much as many of you guys are like, oh, I don't want any more pilots because there's too many pilots. Do we have too many pilots? I won't get to fly from the park beside my daughter's elementary school. Well, guess what? You're not using the park to play on the slip and on the on the curly slide. You're 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 using it to fly an aircraft or a a motorized ultralight vehicle. Um, You're not using it for its intended purpose. And if they allow you to, they're allowing you to through their graciousness alone. So. I really feel like in that situation, like in Tucker's situation, when Tucker's handled it very well, you so. you need to be self-policing, right? So if you have newcomers that come to the park, you need to be aggressive with them about what the expectations are. You obviously can't actually control what they do, but you can show them like, hey, here's what we've done over the last X years that have worked so people don't hate us. And instead they find us entertaining. Here's what we've done to make sure that we're not 
an encumbrance upon the soccer games that are happening there. Here's what we've done to make sure that no one freaks out. We had an employee here who, we, in, in the space of a few months, we had multiple calls from uh, concerned citizens, the police, the fire department, uh, because he would do aerobatic maneuvers with the smoke on and then disappear and then stay low for 10 minutes. And people thought he died. And so it looked like, oh, he's burning. His, his paramotor's on fire, and he's crashing into the ground. They're like, oh, there's this guy there who's on fire, and he crashed and died. And they didn't understand the concept that there's I'm a motor sure on his back. Y- you may. Um, but, but the reality was, like, we kept asking, like, hey, if you're going to do aerobatics, climb up so people can see you again, and you won't freak him out so bad. <laughs> do something small to be gracious. Because we're the reality is many of the people who are against us aren't really against us. They just don't want to have their heart race. Yeah, I think that that's true. The great thing about public airports, there are two things. One, some people aren't going to be able to have another option. That's all they got. They aren't planning on buying a piece of property themselves. They don't have anyone that they know that's close by. Um, and so the public airport's all they got, and they've really got to, to fight. Uh, the beauty, of course, is that – and that, but as far as – as private or public land that's not an airport that has not borrowed federal funds to be an airport um no we're, you're totally at the mercy of the landowner regardless of whether it's a city or an individual or who it is right and and so but there are some weapons that people can use and <clears throat> uh, and i will go ahead if you don't mind hit me um there is great concern amongst the world out there landowners and others oh, i was to bring this up later and others that we'll uh, do it twice okay well we'll do it twice then i don't know how long we're going to go but uh, four to six hours we should be good uh, i have to <laughs> um cross-examine an expert witness in the morning i better you'll be fine i'll be fine <laughs> um but honestly from my perspective and having recently had a, a para party with i think that we had 20-something pilots total, including a whole bunch of really cool ones, um, that, that I hosted this party up in Georgia. Um, and I thought quite a lot about liability issues. Now, I did break down and force everybody to sign a, a waiver. You did that for your brother. Even though I've, I've had other friends up there to fly before, um, that I did not sign a waiver. I really had barely thought about it. But I did start thinking about liability issues quite a bit and what really are the li- the landowner's liability issues. And in all honesty, everyone's all freaked out about it. They're just not very high. Um, I have a... Hang on, hang on. You're saying that a landowner who owns the property and allows you, the man who can't fasten his seatbelt, first singer of the week, uh to come and fly on his property, let you fall out of your paramotor because your seatbelt was off. Not that you get in the air because you're proper hooked too. Um, <laughs> second singer. Um, what, <laughs> you're saying there's no, there's practically no liability or very little liability upon the landowner himself. Yeah, I have a hard time coming up with a scenario under which a landowner could be at least for allowing individual pilots. I mean, if they were having an event, you know, you, there could be problems. Having a front. school. Or, well, that's a totally different world. If you're instructing someone, then you have all kinds of liability issues. Right. But a landowner just letting his friend or someone who asked come and fly out of his pasture, unless that landowner had created some sort of a trap. Now, this is a giant hole covered in Florida leaves. law, but it's pretty common law throughout the country. Right. had created some situation where most people would think that a paramotor pilot would be hurt. Um, like purposely done so? I almost think it would almost have to be purposeful. It certainly would have to be um, some sort of enhanced negligence. Um, for example, if there was a, a deep pit that you couldn't see until you were right on top of it and someone were to fall into this pit... <laughs> I mean, I could dream this something Indiana up. Indiana Jones stuff right here. I, right. Love, I, mean, it. I, I love it. I could dream. <laughs> I could dream something up, but it, it and it just makes common sense, really, because whose fault is it going to be if a paramotor pilot gets hurt? It's pretty much always going to be the paramotor pilot. It's fault. on us. We're the one making the decision us. to do what we do. That's right. 
So and, as and not just that, we're in con- we are not only just figuratively in control, pilot and command and all that business. We are actually physically in control of every single thing that happens to us from the time we start to launch. And so I don't know how a paramotor pilot's ever going to get to sue anybody else, or more problematic, a paramotor pilot's family right. gets to sue a landowner. Now, not that they couldn't bring a lawsuit, not that a lawyer bring a wouldn't lawsuit. bring it for the hoping that there was insurance. The, but do you see? Obviously, anyone can sue over anything, right? But yeah. as as a as a trial attorney, particularly one that has spent a lot of your life working in personal injury cases, if I and this is something I've wanted to do for years. I want to build a peri-utopia, right? I half, halfway sold that from you. You called it Paravana. All right. Uh, I w- I'd love to have space where we could have a dedicated flying field, a restaurant and bar and campground and all like just a place that we could, we could, we could live. Right. And I, I want to do it at every state that we have a hub location in so that the five or six states around it can come and hang out. Right. If I own Paratopia, and all I've done is provide the dirt to take off on. Jack Blow, not Joe. Joe's up in Ohio. Jack Blow comes to visit, trips, falls, breaks his ankle. Or worst case, trips, falls, smashes his head into his neighbor's propeller because his buddy was taken off at the same time. Traumatic brain injury. He's comatose. His family's suing. You're the property owner. Or I'm the property owner. You're the defense attorney. Or the, the offense attorney, even. Is there an argument? Well, when you add in the commercial aspect of it, that you have paratopia. Okay. What if we don't charge you to fly? If it was an organized type situation where people were believing that you were providing a safe environment for them. What if we just do Yeah, I could dream something up. (laughs) But... Maybe. Like, what if we make a nonprofit? I'm not. I'm trying to find ways to make this happen, well, but, guys. But the the real important thing is that people can legitimately go to their friends and family members, say, "Can I come and fly at your place?" Right. And they say, "Well, I'm scared of the liability." You can legitimately tell them, "I have honestly, I'll be happy to sign a release, and maybe have one to give to them." Um, and tell them that you don't understand how you could possibly hurt yourself and it be their fault. Okay, so I, I have, don't get how that could happen, but I'm sure someone could dream something up maybe. Dreaming it up is fine, but but as as uh, both offense and defensive attorney, you could beat a dream. Yes, if I were to have to defend the case, but what I will tell you and I mostly do plaintiff's work when I'm doing personal injury litigation, what I will tell you is I would not as a plaintiff's lawyer bring a lawsuit against a landowner for a client who died flying as paramotor. Hmm. I just don't see how that would ever fly with a jury, and I wouldn't waste my time and effort doing it. Um, and so it is, it's very legitimate, I think, to, be, to tell landowners that, that you're requesting permission to fly from their property that you don't see how they could possibly have any type of exposure. Not that it'll work, but you could say it with a clear conscience. And I would certainly tell people that. All right, can I spin this off two ways? One, can I put you on the spot? Well, sure. The USPPA has a flyer and I believe a waiver that they offer to landowners when they ask permission to utilize their property. Uh, It was clearly not written by a trial lawyer. Can Aviator hire you to make one that we can share with the community? Um, Put him on the spot. Well, as you well know, <laughs> I have worked extremely hard trying to come up with a potential waiver of liability, which they're di- very difficult to enforce in Florida and most other places. Um, but a, a waiver of liability that can protect Aviator, and I have, um, we have all gone to great efforts to try to figure out Every possible way that a paramotor pilot could kill himself, for this example. Probably my favorite conversation, <laughs> three straight hours with a recorder going, with everything go wrong. Lightning, thunder with wind, thunder without wind. There are about 10 of us doing it, too. Like, we, we had a room full of people recording anything we could think of. The lines could break. The mallions could break. The risers could break. The cat carabiners could break. The swing arms could break. The strings go dangle, according to John, behind the camera. Like We literally went through everything we could. So even if you don't do it directly... 
I would love to have your input to, to help because I think that the community at large, it's, it's one way we can give back to the foundation. We'll pay you. Don't worry. <laughs> I'm kidding. I know you're not worried about that. Uh, we will. I would love to create something through the Aviator Foundation that that offers a legal document that someone could take to their neighbor and say, "Hey, you've got 40 acres of sod. Is it cool if I fly off your off your field and I'll mow it once every two two weeks for you, or whatever it is?" Right? Is that something we could do? Um, Maybe you did put me on the spot, and I will have <laughs> I will have to think about it. But yes, I mean the. The basics, the nuts and bolts, of course, we already have. For a release that I believe, if there is a defendable one out there, it may be the one that we have. Right. Um, I know that the other releases that you and Travis had. Yeah, which we, when we I compiled the five best From everybody ones we could you find. could talk yeah. to. Um, that none of them would have been enforceable in Florida. Right. And um, yours certainly wouldn't have been. Now now I'm, I've, I feel really grateful to your knowledge and experience because we try to be really upfront with people. You know, the reality of paramotoring is that it's largely as safe as you make it. Uh, my, my favorite example came, I think from John, uh, the idea that it's as safe as riding a motorcycle on a race course by yourself. Now there are other elements of course, cause you have the third dimension of, of flight, but, uh, we're in a position where we teach people very, very carefully, but we still want to have a good waiver. You know, we still want to do the best job we can to protect our employees and protect our families. And, and we, we try to follow everything to the, to the end of the letter of the law. Aviator um, really does do everything that it can to be as safe a place and and to um, have their students be as safe as possible. And I think that aviators always done that. When I came here for training a little over two years ago, I know that safety was a huge topic of conversation. I also know that safety is a bigger topic of conversation since I came on board. It's amazing how I have paranoia become, sets in. <laughs> well, no, I have, I've, 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 I'm in the unenviable position of being the cop around here sometimes. And these guys, all everyone who flies out here, they're my best buddies and they're my friends. And I, I um, don't like having to be, as they all know, if the instructors are sitting at the other hangar watching, I know they're laughing. <laughs> Hi guys. Um, but I, um, I have occasionally <clears throat> allowed my concern about this or that um, calls me to have to be the the mean guy and the and the bunch and the family. Um, and I don't like that part. But I can say that Aviator. You guys, you do everything that you can to be as safe as possible, um, and partially because your lawyer yells at you if he thinks that maybe you're not doing and, everything. And the reality is we're always learning. We, we were talking about this with, sure. the, with the class this last week, um, my wife's class. It's like we realized that the weather windows were closing on us, so we went balls to the wall, man. We, we, we went full throttle. We said, all right, we have a ton of student equipment. We have a motor for every person and then some. We have wings for every person and then some. We have instructors for every person and then some. We said, we're going to go out and we're going to get everyone in the air at once. We have a short window. The winds are going to pick up. And we did. And everyone flew. My wife got two great flights. Like Everyone flew. Her first flight, she didn't like so much. Second one was better. So we're, we, we're like, we're, we're going to work it. And we worked it. And then after we worked it, we had our instructor debrief. And we're like, nope. It was cool, it worked, everyone was safe, but we're gonna take a step back. We're gonna learn from our experience. We're gonna learn from having eight pilots in the air plus the ancillary flyers flying on the other side of the field. We're gonna take a step back and say, how can we make it safer? How can we make sure there's no chaos? How can, it's because we're always developing, right? All right, I'm jumping back. Second part of this. First part was, we read a, a waiver for us. Second part was to talk about We've already confronted the idea of public use, parks, that kind of thing, and the fact that we have no legitimate rights. In fact, if you go to, and this is not due to paramotor activity, when I first learned to fly paramotors, there's one sign in front of our local soccer field that has no soccer games right by the lake, and it says just a few words, no motorized vehicles within the park. So we know they're already banned, right? You can do it but you might get fined, you might get 
in trouble for doing so. So what's next from there? The next step was personal property. We talked about the fact that the, the landowner most likely holds very little liability unless he's purposely trying to trap or injure, right? So, and I know we are, but the, and again, I'm, I'm going back to Aviator Foundation stuff because part of the reason why that was founded, A, was to help people in need get the opportunity to have their fl- first flight, to be able to taste what flying is, to see how it changes who they are. The other side of it was the defense side, to be able to be a legal defense because we had your wisdom, your experience on tap to say, hey, you know, we can use the funds that people donate to our nonprofit to defend people. And I want to bring this one up because we're not going to talk about it too much tonight because we've already gone a long time. Um, but Minneapolis. 19... Oh, just in Minneapolis. Oh, that's right, yeah. Uh, 1982, I believe it was, or 84. They, I've not read all the case law. My understanding is that the greater Minneapolis area outlawed all ultralight activity at all of their public use airports without a safety study. Now there are airports like Zephyr Hills, which did the prescribed safety study. They discovered that the FAA chose that the glider operations, the skydiving operations, the light sport activity, the general aviation activities all precluded that it was not safe to operate ultralights. In specific, ultralight paramotors, powered parachutes, they, they were too slow for the pattern speeds. Totally legal, totally fine. Minneapolis, five airports, millions of people, none of that, from my understanding, right? So the, f- the foundation was created to try to give people like that an opportunity to have a great legal defense or offense to say, hey, let's break down 40 years of BS and do something worthy. So I don't remember where I was going this. Dead gummit. You outlawed me. Shocker. I didn't mean to. <laughs> it seems like we've been talking a long time. Do we still have anyone listening? We have a hundred and we ha- we're up to one hundred and sixty-eight, one fifty-six right now watching live. This is officially our highest viewership for a live podcast. We'll get a few thousand that watch later on, but to everyone who's watching, guys, thank you very much for being here. I, I I've been wanting to have John on the show for such a long time. Because it is it is a sensitive subject, and it's one that's near and dear to my heart. It's why we fought so hard for Lake Wales. I got a uh, text yesterday from Jeff Cohen. He's like, I heard you moving to Punta Gorda. It's like, what? <laughs> so he, he calls me, and he's like, I heard you were moving. I, you know, we were flying at Swanee, and everyone said you were moving. I said, no, my family's been in Lake Wales for 101 years. We're not moving. He said, I heard you're moving. I said, well, we're opening another location so we can serve our students, but we're not moving. He's like, oh, thank God. <laughs> you know, <laughs> it's like, Jeff, come on, man. Have a little hope. We so, think everything's good here right now. It sure feels like it because it was absolute terrible war and it, for over a year. And it was honestly, it was getting in the way of my fun out here. It I, was. Mine I, too. And yours too. Yeah. And Travis's too. It was not. Not a good time that way. It was a long journey. But I think that it's fortunate for the paramotor community out there that Aviator, of all of the paramotor companies or entities out there, Aviator got picked on too. Because Aviator was strong enough to be able to stand up and fight. And I have a number of our friends who live in other places have just given up when yeah. they ran into problems at airports because they just didn't think they were strong enough to fight it. Well, and the reality is it, it's not just the fiscal costs. The, you know, paying paying uh, legal fees hurts. Um, the emotional cost to my family, to me coming home stressed out every day about what the heck was this airport manager going to pull next? What was going to have to easily disprove in in his case it was easy to disprove that he was not right but it was still an emotional tax um and i'm I'm grateful that i had you by my side to, to, to help guide us through it because it was it was tough like and knowing that the reality was we have plenty of friends with property we have plenty of property available around here for such cheap prices that it made sense that we could easily go and, and, and invest in it. But 
it was like, this is home. I've had a hangar here since I was 13 years old. This is this is a place that if we left would be a ghost town. Why would why would we let something that's special like like Lake Wells Airport? Why would we let something special die? I suspect that in most places, if you were to attempt to have a paramotor business of some kind outside of an airport, um, that you would have to get some sort of zoning exception. That's the other side that's, yeah, that's and, a whole and other that's, conversation. That's the part that we haven't <laughs> tested yet. But I can say, for example, I have talked to a number of people. I don't know anything about zoning. But I've talked to a number of other people, lawyers who do know about zoning, about the possibility of opening a place where paramotor pilots could go and hang out a free from Paratopia. The, huh? Paratopia is what you call it because you <laughs> apparently didn't like my name. Um, what was yours again? Paravana? Paravana. Uh, heaven. I think that goes with paramotoring. You know, Utopia. It's, it's, up, it's up there, too. Come on now. Yeah, well, <laughs> that's true. But the idea of having a place where people could come and pay a very small fee to, to fly, um, but where they could fly without the concerns of harassment has just seemed to me like such a grand idea. What we haven't done yet is actually buy a piece of property and attempt to get the zoning changed. And I think that if you were going to buy a piece of property, you should do it for that purpose. You should be smart about it. Now, you buy the property for your own use, you can do whatever you want to there. You don't have to get any zoning approval. That, that's true. Um, John has a question behind the camera. Can a public park or beach set up a sign to keep you from flying above? Can a public park, park or beach... Set up a sign to keep you from flying above I believe it. the answer to that, that's more of an aviation question, but I believe the answer to that is absolutely not. The absolutely FAA, not. The FAA controls all of that, and um, there's a whole show to be done on, on matters like how do you access um, federal lands. Um, I'm a believer. BLM. I believe that the Bureau of Land Management, which controls millions and millions and millions of acres out west, that under their regulations that you could launch from there – but because but that I because I have wheels right. that I have a vehicle and I have to stay on established roads to launch from there. Right. But I think that all of that land out west is available. The only problem is so much of it is in places where it just doesn't get where you can fly very comfortably very often. Well, that's what I said about next next summer we're taking the Kit Fox out west with the RV and the kids, and my plan is for my wife and I to hop in the Kit Fox. Someone watching the kids, keeping them safe fly onto the top of a mesa somewhere, yeah. land, pull the parameters out, explore Monument Valley. Like, what an opportunity. What a, what a space. But to answer the question directly, absolutely not. You put a sign up that says you can't fly over. According to case law, which I've read far more than I ever thought I would even consider reading. I, I thought 10 years ago, if you asked me if I would read 10 pages of legal documents, I would have laughed in your face. A year ago, when I finished my 10,000th page, probably, <laughs> of reading, I've learned so much. Don't understand half of it, but I get the, the, the bullet points. Uh, the most that any judge has ever awarded as territory owned to a farmer, there was someone flying across his field, and he stip the, the, the farmer stipulated that he was trespassing without touching the property. The judge stated that he owned up to the vertical height of the area in which he had built, which in his case was that he owned the air up to the top of his barbed wire fence. So if the aircraft had been below the, the fence height, the pilot was trespassing. Above the fence height, he was not. Because when we own land, we don't own air. So if you live in Dubai and you happen to own a skyscraper, you might own a whole lot of air around it. But for the majority of landowners, uh, you don't. Well, you're not trespassing, but you can become a nuisance and you can get, be enjoined from... Absolutely. If you're going to be an idiot and decide that the only way that you can have fun is being a paramotor pilot is by flying over people's houses. Yep. I had a lady not long ago who lives on a lake that's south of here, out in the middle of nowhere, Surveyor's Lake. She, I was telling her about what I do. She's a court reporter. And she told me that some jerk came and flew over her house three times. And the first time, she said, I thought it was really neat. And the second time, I was thinking, well, you're getting a little bit close to me, buddy. And the third time, I started to call the cops. 
Hmm. So why can't people just figure that out? Why don't why, we we can fly anywhere? We yeah. don't have to fly over people's houses. People, if you fly with the expectation that everyone's already annoyed with you, it makes life so much easier. Most people think it's great. When we were in Georgia, just how many farmers once. did we have come oh out? Oh my god! By the fourth day after you left to go off on some other adventure, we had we had. Uh, bunch of farmers that started showing up in my pasture to watch That's us. That's so cool. I haven't heard a single complaint from so, any of the local people, and I think I would have heard if someone was irritated. We've covered airports. We've covered public use areas. Uh, we haven't really covered, and this is one topic I want to hit. It'll be a quick one before we answer questions, and that's privately owned airports or properties. We're going to do this in two parts. First one's airports. Uh, what are our rights? Not public use, privately owned, public or private use. And then properties. I guess we kind of cover the properties when I write it with the New Jersey thing. So let's just talk about privately owned airports and what are our rights as paramotor pilots? Well, if they accept federal funds what for if they their don't? airport, which I don't even know if that happens. I do not know of an instance where it has. I'm sure there may be, but I don't know of an instance. Then where they would it has. have the obligation to let public fly there, but otherwise, no, they can tell you to leave just like you can tell someone to leave your house. So if you are utilizing a private airport, let's say you decide to go down the street to the private airport just south of here and fly there instead. It's a public use private airport where you go to the Shadley Suzanne, my family's place, right? Privately u- privately owned, public use, no federal funds. Uh, my uncle owns the airport. He has a requirement, not for airplanes, But for paramotor pilots, if you want to utilize his airport, you text him the morning you want to fly, before you get to the airport, before you fly. If he doesn't reply to you, you don't use it. And he requires every pilot. Now, years ago, we used to train out of this airport. He required all of my students to text him individually for personal permission. At the time, it seemed a little outlandish. I would think that I'd say, hey, Uncle Eric, I'm coming with, you know, six pilots and we're going to fly. Is it cool if we fly? He'd be like, it's fine if you fly. Have them text me. It was his control. It's his It's his space. It's his right, right? And he had every right to disallow, and he never did, to disallow anyone he wanted to, but he wanted them each to humble themselves and contact him and say, hi, my name is, and I'm coming with Eric to learn to fly. Is it okay if I fly from your airport today? Was he within his legal rights? Yes. Yeah. Sure he was. Now, let's say let's say we piss off the neighbors, and those neighbors contact the FAA to make a complaint against the airport, and he decided not to allow us to fly there at all, which didn't happen, but it could have. If he decided that you couldn't fly there anymore, then you couldn't fly there. Right. I'm just wanting to make sure you said that because I could say it all day yeah, yeah. until I'm blue in the face, but no, you absolutely. saying it matters. All sure. Right. And— if you own a piece of property and you're concerned about letting other paramotor pilots come out and fly there, I don't think you're being very genuine or you don't know very much about the liability issues. Um, because while I did have everybody sign a release, my brother, who was also a lawyer, said, you're going to have everyone sign a release, aren't you? Um, but as I've thought through it, I just really don't believe that landowners suffer from any real substantial exposure. Now, whether or not their insurance would cover them if something were to happen is entirely another topic. It is. And that's, man, that's a, we that's a big one. We don't have even close to enough time for that. We don't. This has actually gone long already. We're going to answer a bunch of questions really quickly. Uh, I want to bring up a quick story. When Aviator was in his early years, we were operating out of uh, Friends Fields. And their families, these are very wealthy families, families who have tens of thousands of acres, very successful businesses, and they had we had a seven-acre field we operated out of. Uh, for those of you who might be considering buying property, 20 acres, in my opinion, is the bare minimum. 20 acre square is a bare minimum space to be able to safely operate as a beginner paramotor pilot with no, with no nothing around it. 20 acres is great. That's a, that's a comfortable space. We had seven acres. It was downhill every direction with orange trees on the outside, right? Uh, and eventually, we had a competitor that went to them and was like, Don't let them fly here. I don't know why this competitor did that. He was shooting himself in the foot because he didn't have a place to fly either, but it it happened. Um, He made them scared of the liability. But the reality was their liability was for those seven acres only. 
And not only that, if they had those seven acres mortgaged to the hilt, the liability is something they owe money on, right? So if you're going to go buy 20 acres, keep it mortgaged, let all your friends and family and, and, and fellow aviators fly there, according to my attorney, it, apparently we're fairly safe. So that's good. Yeah, there there's definitely a way to, to have paratopia <laughs> um, where it would work, where the liability issues would be something you would have to live with the possibility, but that would be about it. Very small, right? Yeah. All right, so guys, uh, first off, John, thank you. And I want other people to start paratopias around the country because I want to come and fly there. My goal is 15 of them. I want 15 paratopias at Aviator core locations sometime in the next 50 years or five. We'll see. <laughs> Not to get too excited about things at all. Well, you would never dream. I, I don't believe in dreaming. I feel like if you dream, <laughs> uh, you know, no, I'm just kidding. Uh, he, he does guys, believe in dreaming, believe me. <laughs> I'm so thankful that we have John here. I'm thankful for each of you guys. We, we have a huge audience tonight. Lots of great questions, lots of input. Uh, I really want to thank all of you for taking the time to, to invest in your knowledge of what is legal, what is safe, how to act courteously. Again, going back to the very beginning of this podcast, if you missed the beginning, please take the time to rewatch or re-listen. Take the time to invest in yourself, to understand that there are times when it's incredibly valuable to know the law and to be able to push that law, whether it's hiring an attorney or working on your own. But secondarily, there are much or many more times where it's more important to act in courtesy, to be gracious, and to understand that as right as you may be, you can be dead right. So please don't do that. We want to have the best possible experience for everyone involved. We're going to scroll up to the questions really quickly and answer uh, a whole bunch. Holy cow, so many questions. Uh, Kevin Kruger asks, can you speak specifically to BLM land when you get to public land use? John, you happen to own a whole bunch of acreage out in Montana uh, that is near BLM. Can you walk through it? I believe you're allowed to walk on Bureau of Land Management controlled land. You're not allowed to drive all over. You have to stay on established roads. So I believe that um, that if you're flying a trike, that you have to stay on an established road. But I think that a paramotor pilot, I don't know why they couldn't take off from anywhere and land anywhere. And the BLM does have their own regulations. I know I've never studied them much. But I know that people, for example, helicopter hunters into Bureau of Land Management land in Montana where they don't have there's no public access to the land. Um, and so, th- and there are airstrips, of course, throughout a lot of that. As a matter of fact, in the upper Missouri river breaks, there are like 14 airstrips. And when you read about them and the, whatever the nav thing is that you pilots read, when you read about them, it says things like, um, caution fire pit built in middle of runway <laughs> and they have rules that ask you to take everything out. But, um, but, and all kinds of cautions about how the runways are not maintained. So my your, goal your is to, fox is going to be bad to the bone from there. My goal is to land at each one of those next summer. Yeah, well, they're all within striking distance of about twenty minutes from my place. So I'm in. So with my understanding of BLM is it's very similar to everything else we've talked about. Uh, many years ago, uh, I received a few phone calls that people were flying over the Mardi Gras parade here, and people were freaked out. There's like there's four paramotors flying over the Mardi Gras parade. They're flying right over all the people, and their perspective was off. I I, I saw the the GPS track of where they flew. They flew two miles south. They followed the railroad railroad base, and they ended up coming across over here to this airport. They launched east of or east of town, came west of town. They never flew over anyone, but the perspective of the audience goers was that they were being flown over. Right, uh, uh, last year we flew at the Mardi Gras parade ourselves. We launched in a soccer field. We flew over the lake. We never flew over the people. We landed next to the people. Everyone's super stoked. Everyone's happy. It's all about perspective, right? So if you're flying at BLM land, even you in a quad, you may be specifically told you may not operate a wheeled vehicle, but it may state you're not allowed to operate a motor vehicle. Is a paramotor a motor vehicle? The BLM land that I have seen says motorized vehicle. Okay. And when I looked it up, um, I, beli- I came to the conclusion, this was some time ago, this is summer, <clears throat> I came to the conclusion that I had to stay on an established roadway if I was going to launch from the BLM. Interesting. So I have a lot of friends who fly bush planes, uh, and I see them landing all over BLM. 
Um, I don't know if they're doing it because they can get away with it or they're doing it because they have some sort of way around the law. I will find out because I plan on doing it, <laughs> but I don't know yet. I, that's the other side about it. The BLM lands are typically vast and, and unpopulated. Remote. Yeah, and indeed. So, again, it goes back to being gracious, not being rude, doing your best part. All right. Uh, question. I'll be introducing myself to the city airport manager soon. Any suggestions when I go? Mike Brennan, uh, it, it's the same as any conversation you have with anyone. How is your existence going to benefit them? When you go to your airport manager, Mike, my, my usual tact, is, like when we're looking at launching a new school, is to talk about our economic impact, talk about how we're not going to negatively impact them, how can we be courteous to them, how can we create a, a win-win situation. So whether it's, hey, I'm going to buy fuel from your fuel farm, or hey, I anticipate eventually hosting an event here and we'd love to bring people in, how can we bless your airport? Or how can we not be in a position? Because most airport managers are really just concerned with not dealing with more struggles than they already have. So in, in my opinion, it's all about coming in like you would with any relationship, being gracious as possible. Drake's Fortune asks, is it legal to take off from any public park, assuming it has space and is relatively unpopulated? Yeah, I don't, unless there's a law preventing it, then you have the right to use the park too, I would think. And we actually went through this with the city of Lake Wales before we moved to Lake Wales Airport. Uh, th we were kiting beside the lake next to the walking trail. Uh, and the city works department, their, their parks department, uh, had concerns because they felt as if it was not okay for us to kite. We weren't flying motors. They, they didn't feel like it was okay for us to kite because they felt like it was distracting people when they were walking. And I had the conversation with them. I was like, would you stop a kid from flying a kite? Like, I totally understand. If, if there's something we're doing that's unsafe, I get it. I respect it. I'll follow it. But would you stop a five-year-old from flying their first kite by the lake? They're like, well, no. I said, what, what additional risk are we offering? What is that we're doing? We're a commercial enterprise, but we have a business license to operate in Lake Wales and on our private land and public land. Like, what, what are we doing that's unkind? And, and it, it took them some time to recognize the fact that we're having fun like a five-year-old. <laughs> you know? Well, one thing that you can be sure of is if you try to fly out of a park and you become an issue to anyone who's willing to be loud and noisy about it, you're going to be facing something like what Tucker's facing. I think that's inevitable. Don't you? I do. I think, I think that's the, the core thing to take away here using public non-airport property is to understand that we really – hold the keys to the kingdom. If you are enjoying a space, you have to you have to police it with grace. If you have new pilots coming in, it's hard. I hate confrontation. It's it's like it's why I can never be a lawyer as much as I, I love the concept. I I despise confrontation, but you have a new pilot coming to your field, take the time, walk them through what your rules are, write them down. Write down the rules for your group. We've done this at Aviator. We, we, our students follow a certain pattern. They follow a certain area. They have ground spotters on, that, are, that are operating airband radios. They're talking to every airplane that flies in That whenever they do. We're constantly observing, and we have very clear set rules for them. We have landing areas that are designated. Like If you have a PBG-3 or better, you can land in this landing area. If you have a PBG-2, you can land in this landing area. If you have a PBG-1, you land in this area. There's, there's no conversations but we can only dictate ourselves. So when Joe Blow or Joe Snow <laughs> shows up here and wants to fly, we share with them impassioned pleas to follow our policies. We don't have control. We rely upon the goodness of the sport, but we impassionately plea with them to not fly over the pot farm just west of the field because they have a SWAT team and they're worried about us flying over. We, we impassionately plead with them, don't fly over where the Rockefellers have their homes six miles from here because they're wealthy and they have political clout and we don't want to annoy them at 6.40 a.m., right? We, we, we work really hard to be courteous ourselves and then encourage others to follow that courtesy. And the reality is that we can't control everybody. One thing as far as public parks are concerned, it seems to me that if we were to limit our flying 
to times when the park was not being used for soccer yes, games and things. Exactly. I mean, around here, most of the flying happens in the first hour of the day and the last hour of the day. So maybe you miss your sunset so flight. Do that everywhere. And maybe you miss your sunset flight. Because the park's right. full of people. But guess what? You don't have – I look at – one of my core values as a person is always worrying about other people more than myself. And I, anytime I fly near a sports field that has people playing in it, like that Mardi Gras flight, Little League was going off on the other side of the lake, and I, I felt so bad. My, my buddy Marcus is texting me. He's like – sending me videos of us flying over the lake and they're, they're right beside the lake as well. And I'm like, I really hope I'm not distracting the players. You know, these poor kids are out there trying to be, trying to be good at their game. And I, I hope we're not distracting them too much. If you're flying from a public park where kids are trying to play a game and you're distracting them and you make the home team lose, that's on you guys. Like, come on. All right, let's go to the next question. Uh, anybody else fly under MOAs? John asks. Yes, we fly under, uh, under an MOA right here. We're in the MOA uh 2801 b i think or c um it's a military operating area it's zero issue we just have to be more aware because military vehicles might be operating in the area okay we have a great question from john he says does a posted sign automatically enact some kind of law that we are required to follow well, sort of it does. It doesn't actually create a law. But what it does do is it, it creates a prohibition against entering the property set forth by the property owner. If you violate that propos- that prohibition and enter the property anyway, then you're doing what's called trespassing. So or So sign on the public beach, for instance. No says no vehicles on the beach. Right. If you do not, well, in that instance, if it's a public beach, then there's probably a public ordinance that said no driving on the beach. And there's probably fines associated with if you do drive on the beach. So John, John Hancock just asked, what about foot launch? And I'm, I'm going to extrapolate on the question slightly because Jason Gutt asked it very nicely. He said, is a paramotor considered a vehicle? Asking because ve- uh, beach access signs say no vehicles are allowed on beach. The sign of the be- beach says no vehicle access. I do not believe that a, a foot launch paramotor is a vehicle. I do believe, however, that a... Uh, if you have wheels, that that's a vehicle. I think it really Under depends most, on... Uh, it depends on the definition that's provided by whoever right. enacted the rules. So if you look at federal aviation law, the federal aviation regulations, we are an aeronautical vehicle, right? Foot launch paramotors are an aeronautical vehicle. However, according to most state and municipality laws, we are not. Uh, for instance, on the east coast of Florida, uh, I have a friend who uh, they went to a, a flying site that's been used for many years, and he had hurt his back and put his, his paramotor backpack on a light trike. Uh, everyone else was foot launching, no factor, no issues. He decided to, to launch his trike on beach wheels on the beach. Did so beautifully, no issue. Came back and landed and was apprehended by police informing him that he had broken the law of having a vehicle on the beach. So again, I, I have not read their municipality's laws, but there- I, I don't believe that foot launching is a vehicle. I don't. I really don't think that it is. However, at least in most definitions. However, it's just one city commission meeting before they come and stick a. Or maybe not even that. Right. Before they come and stick a sign that says no flying from the beach. Which which we saw Tucker go through that. Like, exactly. That's, that's a and, big deal. And that and that of course covers all paramotor. Nick Griffith, legality of flying from a school field. That uh, depends on the school's rules. Correct. Is it legal to fly tandem on a paramotor in the USA? Hey, Blaze, good to see you, my friend. Uh, yes. It is legal to fly tandem if you have a exemption from the FAA under FAR 103. All right. Um, J.D. Bauman, if an airport hasn't taken federal funds in the current year but has in the past, are they still obligated to, uh, obligated to allow you to fly? It's a really tough question of when they're— uh, There is a statute yeah. that sets forth exactly how long the obligations last. Which, From the time that they accept federal funds, and I believe it's 20 years. I believe it is as well because our one of our arguments with our before you uh, challenges in getting on this airport when the management was completely different was that they were not following their non-discrimination rules along with several others. And they the city was potentially going to have to pay back like $20 million in grants if it was proven— so it's one of those things where not 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 just this city, but other cities we've spoken to, 
they must follow those those grant assurances for a really long time. Yeah, the regulations allow the FAA to pull their federal funding. Yep. Any future federal funding if they violate those grant assurances. And my understanding is that and, they can actually have to repay past funding, or is that incorrect? I don't know the answer to that, but I do know that, that they can um, refuse to fund anything else. Interesting. Interesting. All right. Uh, how do you find out if the airport receives federal funds from Alex Diaz? Uh, you can um, probably call them and ask them. They are required um, to tell you under pretty much any yeah, open but, policy. But at, at a minimum, um, Alex, you can send them a letter, and they will have to let you know. Yep. They must re- They must respond. Uh, in Florida, we have the Sunshine Act, which is a, a concept of sharing federal information or government information without any uh, filter, aside from filters required by security. And uh, the the reality is that many of them you can find out just by popping to the airport manager's I, office. I have yet to hear of a municipal or county airport, small airport. That does not. GA airport that doesn't accept federal funding. I mean, that's how they maintain their runways and things. That's how they grow, if they're going to and grow at all. So I think it's going to be the case at almost every public airport, small public airport. Well, mm. the large ones too, I'm sure. The other thing you can do uh, that I would encourage you is uh, do heavy Google research. Uh, when I am looking at a flying site to, to enjoy, for whether it's a, a beach site or a, a public park, I will go to the city. I'll go to Google, type in the city name, type in ultralight, type in flying, type in park, and try to read the minutes from the previous meetings to see if there has been some sort of code initiated. Or in the case of an airport receiving funding, I, I look to see federal grant, Lake Wales Airport, boom, instantly you'll find minutes that are public record that you can find out exactly what the re- reality is. Uh, Sam Skinnier asks, what kind of access are they required to le- legally give you into the airport grounds, gate access, et cetera? How is that handled? Good one for you, John. Well, uh- <laughs> Honestly, I believe that they have to to give you reasonable access. They cannot treat any person different, one person differently than another, and they have to give you access. They have to give you reasonable access to allow you to conduct your proposed aeronautical activities. They can always go to the FAA and say these paramotors are unsafe. Please do a we, study. We don't yeah. want them flying here. Or we don't want them fly. We, it's unsafe for them to fly here, and they're they're going to then commence what i understand may take a couple of years um they're going to send it to flight standards and they're going to go through a long uh, study to determine right. whether it's safe paramotors are safe or not and i haven't and seen him do that yet but to to pick on john a little bit he's not an employee of aviator uh he is employed by aviator as a contractor but he's not an employee, so John's been wanting a, a magnetic key card, one of these these ID cards to be able to get into the power gate for a year, for over a year. And the people at the airport don't like me anymore, so I don't get one. I'm the only one that doesn't have one. Of all my buddies I fly with. It's true. Daily. It's true. But they, they stipulate that they're for employees of tenants or for tenants of the airport. And so legally they have every right to tell you that you're not allowed to have one they probably should give him one because he's going to keep fighting. Um, well, you would think they would give me one to keep me from having that little burr on my <laughs> saddle all the time. But he does have access to the, the coded gate, which he has to open and close himself. Uh, and and while that is a, a challenge and a frustration, the reality is it's doable. So they're required to give you access. They're required to allow you to to be able to reach it without a, an ADA complaint. Um However, th- there was a period of time where some local pilots were coming down and they were driving their trucks and trailers into the infield of the airport, into the object-free zone, parking them, unloading their paramotors, flying around for three hours, going away from the airport, coming back, landing. And they were very upset that they were asked to move their vehicles back outside the gates. And it was like, well, you have to walk 200 yards. I'm really sorry. Uh, but I understand their, their contention. There, there wasn't, in their opinion, there wasn't a safety issue. But according to the FAA, there was. So the airport was right in requiring them to bring their stuff in, push it to where it wants to go, or carry it to where they want to go, and then take their vehicles back out. It's just a tough balance. Uh, all right, let's see. J- Jim Sierra 120 on that note, what does it take to bring this Paradigm team on tour? A major sponsor, brother. We need a major sponsor so badly it hurts. Uh, for, for a show, 
it's more money than you would ever imagine because we're moving 20 plus people across the country and from around the world. Uh, we need a sponsor really, really badly if we're going to do another season of Paradigm. We want to. Uh, it's just it's economically non-viable at this point. So if you have friends who own a business who would like to have some national exposure, international exposure, let us know. And we will be happy to uh, to help. James Dunn, for grants executed subsequent to the passage of the Civil Rights Act of 1964, the statutory requirement permit prohibiting discrimination remains in effect for as long as the property is used as an airport. Interesting. So it's 20 years from the date of execution of a grant prior to 1964. It's non-limited after 1964 based upon civil rights. Cool. Yes, that sounds about right. That sounds good. All right, we're getting to close, guys. I apologize. This is we're getting there. Uh, can you discuss recreational trespass laws and how they protect landowners? Eric Bangston, John, you want to go into trespass laws? How, I um. Can you discuss? I'm afraid rec- I don't know what recreational trespass laws are. I know what trespass laws are. I don't think typically there's not a distinction between if it's trespass for recreation or trespass for some other purpose. Generally not. John Schnauter says, what other states does John practice law in? Um, Georgia and Montana. Yep. Jason, can I fly over national parks or over national wildlife land? Uh, Jason, I'll answer that one. The the short answer is look at your sectional, follow the sectional. Uh, Generally, there are areas in which you can fly over, but you cannot land in. And there are areas in which the FAA requests that you fly at least 2,000 feet AGL above. 2,500. Is it 2,500? I think so. Am I wrong? I'm always wrong about stuff like that. You might be. And if I'm right, I'm going to dance. Well, no, I'm usually wrong about things like that. And so we can assume that I am this time too. But if I am right and you, the pilot, are wrong, Ah, man, that that would would be be, really cool. That'd be awesome. Because I don't pay attention to things. Instructors watching in the red shop, let us know. Let us know. Uh, What other requirements can an airport require for PPG to fly from an airport? I'm going to add an ellipsis to this. Um, Can a airport require a ppg pilot to fly with a certain light a certain radio a certain uh legally based upon your understanding and and i'll I'll answer as well what other what other requirements can an airport require from a paramotor or ultralight pilot i believe that the airport gets to control what happens on the ground so for example i believe that an airport could designate an area for paramotor pilots if they had a decent reason to do it. They could designate an area and they could require all the paramotor pilots to fly from there. Right. Um, but they... What do you think? So it's it's a it's a leaning tower of Pisa. You you have airports, uh, for instance, there's a uh, front of the airport up near Jacksonville, fantastic airport. They require that ultralight pilots fly with a radio. Uh, however, uh, while I love... My pilots flying with, going now. with a radio. Uh, I love the idea. I love that uh, they are able to be in contact. These airports in uh, North Carolina that I know of the same rules. Um, several airports in Florida. Uh, the The fact of the matter is that legally under federal law, requiring an ultralight vehicle to operate a radio has a, a myriad of issues. The first is that it's discriminatory because like my Piper Cub, for instance, uh, my 1946 Piper Cub that I owned for a year does not have a radio equipped uh the one that was in it did not operate uh it it had no electrical system the airport that we fly from here is a non-controlled airport or non-towered airport it's still controlled but non-towered and does not require a radio under the under far's period uh so requiring an ultralight pilot to utilize one is discriminatory secondarily to that and this is a whole different ball of wax is uh fcc regulations which the FCC, which I don't have the regulation in front of me, I apologize, um, stipulates that aircraft pilots are allowed to utilize the VHF frequencies without using a license to operate their VHF radios, which is normally required. This is why you have, you know, K92 FM, you know, they have to list their identifier when they're broadcasting every X number of minutes because they're broadcasting on the, the, these frequencies. Uh, aircraft pilots aren't required to gain a license to broadcast, but they are required to broadcast with their N number, which is in turn their license. By having no N number, legally, legally, according to the FCC, 
which is the governing body regulating any radio transmissions, we as ultralight pilots are not legally allowed to utilize an aviation radio. Yeah, that's a really groovy argument for I'm, I'm 60 years old. And they didn't say groovy when I was a kid. <laughs> <laughs> now, I'm, I'm all for it. Like, I'm all for ultralight pilots using a VHF uh, aircraft radio. I think it's a great safety precaution. That's why we have the aircraft ban radio on our yeah, aviator helmets. I, don't, I do not believe that an airport can restrict aeronautical activities. Um, Based upon by equipment. S- correct. Exactly. Yeah. Exactly. So. The, the reality is that it's it's. I think it's a safer option to utilize a, a, an airband radio. I've never heard of the FCC fining or coming after anyone for utilizing one without a license. However, if you just read the law and follow the law, and your airport says you have to have a, a, a airband radio legally. A, they can't because it's discriminatory. B, they can't because they're asking you to break another law, which they must follow. Uh, it's just a very tough balance. I like the idea. I like our airport wants to have all the paramotor pilots fly with airband radios, and I'm all for it because I think it makes it safer for everybody. But it's forcing them to break a law that's a federal law, not a city law, and that's a very, very delicate balance. So, yeah, <laughs> makes sense. Absolutely, I think you're right on it. All right. Uh, let's see guys. We're going to answer maybe one more, uh, question. This is a big one. It comes from James Dunn question. One option the airport commissioner has to shut down part one of three is to enter into a safety study. There's no term uh, term limit on how long the study can last before determination. Can the FAA simply reclassify classy airspace to shut down part one of three, or is that also discriminatory meaning surface class E where there wasn't surface class E? Whoa. All right. I'm going to try to, uh, thread the needle here. Uh, One of the options is for an airport manager to request the FAA to conduct a safety study. The FAA then has to agree that it is a worthy study for them to complete. Only then can the airport be shut down for utilization by any type of of aircraft or it's just, or or aeronautical use or it's discriminatory. That sounds correct, right? Dead on. The second part of that was there's no time limit, which is true for a safety study. There's no time limit. True. Uh, Can we go back to that, Nina? The next part of that was can the FAA simply reclassify class E airspace to make it surface E? I have an answer to this. Do you have one? Um, I believe that the FAA can um, do as they wish. They can, but only with just cause. So surface E airspace is generally developed or created to protect an instrument approach at an airport that has a high enough traffic uh, volume to have that protected approach, uh, which then creates an issue where it's controlled airspace, not not uncontrolled or not untowered, uh, where you have to get permission. We, we fly in controlled class E surface area frequently just by contacting the controlling agency and asking permission with a time frame and altitude, et cetera. Well, the FAA can, has the keys to the kingdom. And they control everything. Right. And I, I believe that if you were to find that the reason that the FAA changed the um, classification of the airspace was to eliminate paramotor traffic. It wouldn't last. Perhaps you could have a, an argument that the FAA was violating their own statutory or congress's statutory prescription to them i would which agree is to provide po- i mean listen everybody out there everyone in the country that pays taxes pays for this airport right thanks guys if, if the world out there all of those people out there that are, not only do they not fly they never will fly from a general aviation airport if they realized how many millions of dollars <laughs> are being spent for the benefit of such a few number of people i suspect that it would really cause us problems. It probably would. And and I think at the end of the day there with this idea of a, a FAA shift in airspace, the only reason I'm going to do that is if you're just being a dirtbag, right? If you follow the concept of being gracious and kind, if you follow the, the idea that we are here to serve each other, I don't see it ever happening per- personally. Yeah, I think that... um. 
self-regulation in the form of um, perhaps just beating the crap out of someone who comes and screws up your airspace because they're being jerks. Maybe about the only way to deal with individuals out there who are trying to and can ruin it for everybody. I can say for certain the aviator gets blamed for everything that any paramotor pilot in Central Florida does. It's That's true. <laughs> it's true. All right. Guys, we have so many incredible people here tonight. Uh, I thank you very much. Uh, Walter Priori, I'm going to answer your question or have John answer your question. And we're going to call it a night. Uh, Walter says, federal law over state law for ultralights. If, if what he, I think I know what he means in federal law. Federal law always supersedes always. state law. Any, anything that's happening um, off the ground. I, I, I would even imagine, stipulate that you state that for any law as far as, far as reaching as drug laws. I mean, legally, Colorado is operating illegally by allowing recreational marijuana or any marijuana for that matter. So the, the, the action there is that federal law may not be being enforced, although they do have raids and stuff, I guess I've heard, I don't know. I read the news occasionally. Um, but federal law supersedes state law, correct? Right. Okay, good. That's correct. Guys, if you've enjoyed the episode again, it's called preemption, preemption. The more, you know, guys, if you've enjoyed this episode, please leave us a like down below. Uh, Leave a comment, and if you would, I know it's asking a whole lot for you to type a few words, but thank John for me. Oh, no, no, no. Oh, yeah, yeah, yeah. Uh, John's one of my dearest friends, the people I trust with the most in the world, and uh, has been there for our company, been there for my family. I can't thank you enough. Thanks for being on the show. Well, you're welcome, buddy. Thank you for all (laughs) that you do for me, including keeping me in the air, like putting a new exhaust on my machine today. I don't think I've seen a nitro break in that spot before. Well, I'm special that way. (laughs) Oh, man. All right. So, guys, thanks so much. Uh, Next week, another new episode. I don't know who the guest is yet. It might just be me and John. It might be me and my wife. It might be any number of people. Maybe we'll bring John Sidham back on the show if we have enough questions. Um, uh, Actually, next week could be Tucker. Tucker will be in the town. So, guys, thank you for watching uh, for one of our longest episodes yet. Uh, This is going to be fun. Next week, we have Tucker coming in town. I believe Woody, Johnson Q., tons of others that we're going to be in, involved with and uh, we'll, we may even do a round table discussion it should be fun as always we appreciate your your time here we're going to have a new episode of the aviator family show coming out soon uh if you guys haven't watched the announcement video of our adventures next summer like john here please check it out it's the last video on the channel super fun stuff lots of adventures ahead and uh yeah, that's yeah, it. You're coming to see me in Montana. We're coming to see you in Montana, but not just that. We're going to bring probably 15 of the top aviation YouTubers out west for bush flying, paramotoring, speed flying, paragliding, and family adventures all over the Northwest. Well, the West, Midwest, Northwest. I'm pumped. Sounds like a pretty good idea. You coming? Huh? I plan to be along for part of it. All right. All right. Guys, thank you very much. We'll see you all very soon. Have a great night. Have a beautiful week. See you on episode number 29.